Anyway, um, you know, so, so that I think before shipping up to Boston came out, we had already had uh, three full length albums and we were touring all over the world, you know, and, and um, so shipping up to Boston, what, what, what I always like to say shipping up to Boston did for us was, I'll give you an example, say on an average tour, we might do Chicago, Milwaukee, Minneapolis, and then take a day off and be driving down to Denver. Well, after shipping up to Boston, we could play places like Fargo, North Dakota. You know what I mean? Because in those like middle of like almost like third, fourth tier markets, suddenly that we never came up through in that punk rock scene with the local friends because I we didn't know anyone in Fargo. And I'm just using that as an example, you know, but all of a sudden we could go to places where we hadn't previously put down the roots. It didn't really even make the shows bigger in the cities that we were already going to. It maybe made it a little stronger, but it didn't change so much in the places we had already been established. It changed in the places we hadn't been, you know? When you recorded it, were you like, yo, this is a hit? No, not at all. No, because the, um, the, there's an ongoing thing in the growth of the band and having to fight like so there's a desire to want to do like always layer more guitars and more instruments on always make it faster leave no space and if you think about a band like acdc or something why are they so powerful because there's space you know, just a steady you know banging drum beat and then you know they don't they when they leave space between when they all hit a chord that's what makes that chord so powerful. So for years, we were just always like, yeah, in your face. And shipping up to Boston was really like the first song where we left space. You know, the kick drums going, and you got to wait for the next, you know? And um, and so it was very different for us. And it, sometimes when we played it, because it was out before it was in the movie, it wasn't necessarily bringing the house down. It was like, people liked it, but it, it was different, you know? And um, so I think the movie really, you know, and, and, I, and I will say that I'm usually like a pessimist when it comes to like, I remember one time we were in the Sopranos. Uh, you might be too young to remember the Sopranos. that was on HBO. Actually not. It's my favorite TV show of all time. Well, we, we, we were in an episode of the Sopranos and I'm all excited. I'm which, which episode? The son was like going to visit colleges. and um, Anthony you know, Jr. He was always. Well, the, yeah, it was either the son or the daughter. And they were uh, at like a bar and, and, you know, so we had no idea how they were going to use the song and I'm all excited and, and I'm listening and I'm watching and I'm waiting and my phone rings and a friend says like, did you hear it? And I was like, what? I didn't even hear it. So my point is, you know, it, it was just background music in a bar. So just being in something doesn't necessarily mean it's going to connect. It's kind of how it's used, what it's used in and, and, and the departed when we went to the premiere of the departed not like the fancy new york la one but they had a boston premiere and we went to that once again we had no idea how the song was being used when that came on on the opening credits and it was so loud and you know obviously the connection of the movie and the band being the boat and from boston i was like oh man this is going to have an impact and so you know what i mean like if we were just in the departed but we were the volume was lower and it was later in the movie. I think, I think the, that was like the perfect storm of the use and, and, and the type of movie. And it really connected with people, you know, movie was huge. And yeah. so, so you think that was kind of really what gave you the big commercial bump? Did they, did they start playing it in all the stadiums after the movie came? Or were they playing it in, at Fenway and at uh, Gillette beforehand? No, it was all after the movie. And it wasn't really turned it even into, you know. You I, must I, have I, been so stoked when they started playing at Gillette. <laughs> like, this is fire. Yeah, a second. A, a Gillette really doesn't play it a lot. They, they, the Patriots, you, you hear it more on, like, TV than in the games. That DJ at Gillette stays pretty much to, like, the Aussie, ACDC, you know. Guns and uh, Roses. Guns and Roses. He doesn't. But, um. Jonathan Papelbon, who was the closer of the Red Sox, he started to use the song. And that's what really tr made it transcend into sports more than the movie. The movie didn't make it transcend into sports. When Papelbon used it as his song as the closer, that gave it, a, that gave it the connection to sports. We had already had the connection to sports 
through other stuff. Like we, we, uh, in 2003, we did a song called time to go, which is about growing up, going to the Bruins games on your own. Like when you were old enough and for me, like 12 years old, to take the subway into the game, go with my friends, come up and on the causeway street, the, the old uh, L above you and just the, the energy that was outside the old garden. So it wasn't like necessarily a song about the Bruins, but it was, but it was more about the experience of being a Bruins fan. And you had Tessie as well. Freeze and fire. 